All right, let's get started on uh, one of the Medicare's uh, favorite diagnoses. This is about um, healthy hearts and unhealthy hearts. This is about um, CHF. And, you know, you've heard these things where the hospital basically says, uh, we can't have these patients come back within 30 days. We're going to get pe uh, penalized. We have to have some kind of program to uh, avoid this. Uh, Medicare doesn't spend uh, any more money on any other topic other than uh, this. It's interesting, too, that um, the substantial subset of the population who has this is, uh, is, is quite, quite real. We're talking about 5 million people. And it is a, um, some people, depending on how bad this is, this is a terminal disease in terms of if you had a choice of between having cancer and having CHF, in some cases you ought to choose cancer because you'll live longer. Um, these are sudden death cases. Uh, we all know the kind of pathophysiology uh, that is associated with, with, that, with them. We've expanded some of these pictures in your manual so that you can read the, uh, the small worlds, uh, the, the words. But I think that, you know, you know uh, these manifestations in terms of shortness of breath, increased work of breathing, uh, per peripheral edema, perhaps irregular heartbeat, high blood pressure, uh, decreased renal function. Not too long ago, I guess, uh, they came up with, hey, you know, there's, there's more than one kind of a heart failure. And uh, when I was a, a, a trainee, there was like, there was only one kind. Now there's two kinds. There's a systolic heart failure, which kind of makes sense. Basically, you got the uh, left ventricle, and it's weak, maybe because of ischemia, uh, a heart attack. There's not much muscle mass there. So it's weak and it doesn't pull, push out the amount of blood that it's supposed to to maintain the oxygenation of the circulation. And so the bottom line is there is a, the, the percentage of blood that goes out is not there. You need to, normally it's over 65%. When the ventricle squeezes, 65% of what's there goes out and 35% remains. Um, as your heart failure worsens, that percentage goes down. And uh, we get into these numbers in the 40s, which basically means that when your heart squeezes, a lot of the blood stays there and a, only a small portion uh, comes out. And when that blood is there and the next lo load is coming in, it, well, it's already there. So the, you, you get distension of the uh, ventricle, you get a backflow into the lungs. Backflow into the lungs basically means the pulmonary, capillary, uh, ca uh, pulmonary vasculature is uh, becoming full. And then you start leaking out this transudate be, uh, between the, from the uh, capillaries and the alveoli so that the small space between the capillary and the alveoli that allow the gas to exchange now is becoming a problem because you've got this new fluid in there. So it's harder to exchange gas between capillary uh, and alveoli because you have this interstitial fluid. So the uh, oxygenation goes down, the lungs are heavy now, they become more difficult to ventilate those kinds of things. Heavy lungs require more energy, more oxygen, and so you get into this vicious circle of um, ventilatory uh, compromise. That is our traditional view of uh, CHF, but there's also this other view that says the problem isn't the fact that we have a, a, a lax heart in terms of a weak heart and it can't just pump out, there's this other version which is called diastolic uh, failure where in fact the heart, if, if anything, has become hypertrophied perhaps from hypertension and the, heart, and, and the, and the chambers have been coming stiff. So the, when the blood pours in from the atrium, instead of opening up and collecting that blood, it's no, everything's too tight. It doesn't, the blood doesn't fit very well. So, so the bottom line is, is with, the, with lef, less blood in the ventricle, you get less blood pumped out, and the physiologic consequences turn out to be the same. You get the backup of blood into the lungs, you get the uh, capillary uh, leakage, you get the heavy lungs, the uh, go, uh, O2 goes down because of the uh, large amount of interstitial fluid between the capillaries and alveoli, and the, the, and the process becomes the same, but the fundamental causes are somewhat different. This basically is a, a picture of kind of ex explaining the same pathology that I went through. And uh, you can see the, in the picture where the heart seems to be the big, the septum's real large, and the uh, left ventricle is real large, basically. That, those are manifestations and, uh, of hypertension generally. The fact is, is that the chamber becomes relatively small, and the chamber does not have the capacity 
to pick out the walls have become stiff to accept blood into the chamber like it normally did. I went through pretty much the pathology and uh, uh, left heart failure um, here. We see this big heart uh, on, the, uh, on the one side, and we see this big manifestations of interstitial fluid. So there's this white out of the lungs because it's, they're full of water kind of thing. Uh, water, heavy lungs, a lot of work to make them open them, close them, open, close them. Uh, the heart is bigger. In this case, we're traditionally viewing the heart to be big and baggy as if this were talking about systolic hypertension. So systolic hypertension is the most common, but and so we're, we're generally looking for a good sized heart. As the process improves, you can see there's the clearing of the interstitial water. The heart is still um, enlarged, and they stay enlarged. And you take a, a chest x-ray of anybody who has congestive heart failure, uh, which is fairly severe, and that they're going to have a large heart. This is basically a, a nice picture of the manifestations of, well, once it's backed up into the lungs, and the lungs aren't working very well, then the stuff that's going from the right ventricle down into the lungs, it's, it's already full now down there, so that there's a backup of, of blood up into the neck, down into the liver. You have the liver enlarged, the spleen is getting enlarged, you have the peripheral edema, so you have right-sided failure, the most common cause of right-sided failure being left-sided failure. So the idea is this person came into you because they're having an exacerbation. What precipitated that exacerbation? Well, here's the list of things to consider. Is there an intercurrent infection? Well, that's going to be really pretty tough to find out because you just saw that white lung. Where are you going to find the pneumonia in that white lung? Good, good, uh, good luck uh, checking it out, but it's something to consider for sure. S certainly a new episode of myocardial ischemia. These, these, these few remaining... Uh, cells certainly need to be protected in terms of we can't have any more uh, heart attacks going on here. Um, we can't have any more ischemic episodes. Certainly arrhythmia, the sudden onset of atrial fib uh, fibrillation in a, in a patient who is fundamentally uh, prone to guard, um, CHF is bad because once the atria is uh, beating rapidly and, uh, and chaotically, you lose your atrial kick, which was part of the way of getting blood down into the ventricles. Um, you lost that, and now you have the ventricles beating uh, asynchronously, so that in some beats, you know, 30% comes out, another beat, 20% comes out, another beat. And the other thing is fast, the heart's beating fast. Heart beating fast requires more oxygen, so that, so that there's the ability to deliver that oxygen is a problem. So then again, uh, you know, you, you got this circle of declining uh, function. Uncontrolled hypertension is one of the things that you may l be looking for. Why? Because that l left ventricle that is supposed to pump out blood into that a aorta, if the, if the peripheral vascular resistance is high and, and the blood pressure is high, it's going to be difficult to do that. It's going to be difficult. So when we talk about treatment, we want to decrease the blood pressure so that patients, the bl blood can be pumped out kind of easily. No, in this case, the blood pressure is high. They can't pump out, so it goes back up into the lungs, into the lung, right side of the heart, and then makes the whole thing uh, worse again. Obviously, there's this issue of uh, did you been using, having been using the salt shaker a little bit more uh, aggressively than you have. Anemia is an uh, issue here because basically the tissues need their, uh, their oxygen, and the oxygen comes, comes from hemoglobin. If you have a hemoglobin um, of six, you're not going to be able to do this very well in terms of oxygenating your tissues. So the way that you compensate for that is your, you beat, your heart beats faster. You, it's, it's kind of analogous to hyperthyroidism. You're trying to get more blood pu pushed out, even though that blood is watery and thin and doesn't carry a lot of hemoglobin like you would ha have it. The only way that you can fix that is trying to make that weak heart pump more aggressively. And so you can also envision that requires more oxygen. More oxygen is not available. The heart fails even further, and the spiral continues. Um, and then, and th then there are some meds, and the, the meds are listed there, but the one by far that we have to be careful about is giving elderly people NSAIDs. Uh, you got a um, osteoarthritis, and it's, and it's bothering you kind of thing there. Let's give you some NSAIDs. Osteoarthritis is not an itis. We've been very sloppy in what, what, we, what we tack the word itis onto, uh, implying that once we find it's an itis, then we can use an anti-inflammatory, 
and we'll, and we'll pick these. These things retain water and are a clear-cut uh, cause of exacerbations of, of congestive heart failure. So you have, I think you have to be really uh, very gingerly about prescribing these drugs for uh, elderly people who have heart, um, heart failure. Now this uh, chart basically goes through all of the pathology that's supposedly here. And I, I was going through this chart, and, you, and it's really pretty, uh, a lot of this stuff is pretty straightforward. If you cannot beat, uh, pump out blood um, in, qual in quantities that are needed for the circulation to provide oxygen, well then the next thing you do is you pump it out faster. So this, what the natural reaction to um, a failing heart is to have tachycardia, and that's a manifestation of adrenaline. So adrenaline comes out, the heart rate goes up, trying to get uh, more blood into the circulatory system. But there are other manifestations of adrenaline other than causing a tachycardia. You know that it basically causes your pupils to dilate. You also know that it causes your um, uh, vasoconstriction. The skin becomes pale. You start to sweat. So the classic patient in pulmonary edema is cold and clammy as a manifestation of the ad adrenaline that's out there. It, they really don't need that cold and wet, uh, wetness. So we're at the what the job was is supposed to get the heart to beat faster, but they couldn't separate out the various components of what it does. So you see the, the, the cold, clammy um, CHF patient manifested by his, uh, his adrenaline excess, which is one of the things we're going to try to work on a decrease. They're also talking about dyspnea. Okay, that's not going to be orthopnea, like lying down, sitting up kind of thing. Crackles and wheezes. Okay, fine. Cough. Okay. Decrease blood pressure. Now, I obviously stole this slide for some place in the, in the internet, put it up there. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you have congestive heart failure and decreased blood pressure, that is otherwise known as cardiogenic shock. You're not supposed to have a low blood pressure in the setting of CHF because the adrenaline is out there. The adrenaline's job basically is to make your heart beat faster. Bad side effects of it in are your blood pressure goes up, you get the um, vasoconstriction and the sweating. So the idea here is I think this is a mistake. It should, the blood pressure is increased. You want to see an increased blood pressure. It's very easy to treat pulmonary edema when the blood pressure is high. It is very difficult to treat it when the blood pressure is low. That's a bad sign, bad sign. Anything else in here? I think we got the others. Uh, falling oxygen saturation, absolutely. We often try to supplement their, their breathing. We give some oxygen. We'll talk about that in a little bit, a little bit more. Confusion, because basically they have in a, they're not basically getting the, the perfusion that they need. So there may be there some confusion, fatigue. Uh, these gallop rhythms, the large spleen, basically reflection of right-sided right failure. The, this, this, this whole litany of manifestations is basically fairly easily figured out. Next thing is, um, what are we going to do about it? Yeah, I think the diagnosis is generally straightforward. You take a chest x-ray, we see the large heart, this prior history of the same uh, diagnosis. So it generally isn't all that difficult. We can measure BNP. BNP may help, help us. But in the gray zone cases, the BNP may be in the gray zone cases. And in the obvious cases, you don't need it. Um, is this an exacerbation of COPD on top of um, CHF? Makes it uh, kind of difficult. Yeah, yeah, you can throw it in here, but the idea of knee-jerkly doing it in every case doesn't make much sense to me. You're going to look, uh, it, it, they're going to get an EKG, they're going to see if there's ischemia, is there, has there been some new ischemia that has been the precipitant of this exacerbation of CHF? Tachycardia, you are going to expect to have tachycardia, it's going to be sinus tachycardia generally, and that's going to be a manifestation of, of of adrenaline, something that we're going to try to fix because some of the other parts of the adrenaline complex are not really helping the patient, maybe hurting the patient. Um, uh, atrial fibrillation, we did talk about how about that, that being particularly bad. We're going to look for the big heart. We're going to look for the, uh, we're going to look for the ammonia if we can find it. We're going to see the diffuse uh, uh, capillaries leakage showing all of this water in the lungs. Uh, and we're going to measure troponin, and troponin is going to help us determine whether this person has had a heart attack that has not become obvious on the, uh, on the EKG. When we, and we tend to measure it serially. One of the things about troponin, however, we have to remember is that troponin basically does not mean that you have an ischemic heart. 
trop troponin means that you have heart cells that are leaking the stuff inside of them. Uh, and it doesn't have to be done by ischemia. You can have inflammation from a, a viral infection of your heart, which we'll talk about, and that'll leak uh, out troponin. So anything that leaks the tro troponin out doesn't mean that, that, that the exclusive reason is, oh, this is a ischemic process. Not, it, that's not true at all. You're going to measure a comprehensive panel. What, what you want to look at the kidneys, how they're doing. You're going to want to look at the liver, how that's doing. You're going to particularly be interested in the potassium uh, because these people are all taking Lasix, and that's going to deplete them uh, of their potassium. We know that you need potassium to have muscles work aggressively, firmly. You know, you saw these things. I, I'm sure, sure most of you have seen by now this thing called uh, hypokalemic periodic paralysis thing, where these guys come in, their potassium low. They can't lift their legs off the bed. This is a reflection of just how important potassium is in making muscles contract. Um, one of the things we don't me um, uh, measure, which probably ought to be measured, is magnesium. Magnesium, for, magnesium is a vasodilator. It, it has a uh, big uh, function in terms of the, uh, what is that, Krebs cycle kind of thing. This is all about energy utilization. So, the, so diuretics get rid of potassium, diuretics get rid of magnesium. We don't, we don't measure magnesium for some ungodly, I don't know why we don't measure it, because the fact of the matter is it's treatable. You know, one or two grams makes, may make a big difference. It's been shown that you can replace your potassium better when you, sub, when you, can, when you give concomitant magnesium therapy as well. Well-known uh, phenomenon, well-known phenomenon. We don't do it because we don't measure it. What we do is we do something stupid. We measure the chloride. It's called sodium chloride. We don't need to know the chloride. Thank you, Maritz. Why can't we just stick in that little chloride spot the magnesium? Please and thank you. But no, we're going to keep on measuring sodium chloride. Sodium chloride. Um, treatment is pretty straightforward. Maybe they're going to need a little oxygen. But you have to remember, oxygen is a drug, and there's been a lot more written about it lately, particularly uh, in the setting of somebody who has a heart attack. You've got a, you've got a myocardial infarction, and everybody slaps oxygen on these people. The, fa the fact is that this myocardial infarction patient has a 98 O2 sat in their, their little jobber there, and, ac uh, and they don't need any more oxygen. And oxygen is a vasoconstrictor. And so you don't need to give vasoconstrictors. They, th this doesn't help people. So the idea here is use this drug when you need the drug. So the person's got a 9202 sat, fine, give them oxygen. 96, 98, don't bother. You ought to consider changing. Uh, first, you ought to go to your hospital and have them do a little re little, little uh, analysis research on what oxygen does. And you'll find no problem getting papers that saying, you know, oxygen uh, is, is not without some problems. I mean, we give it to the neonates, and next thing you know, they've got an oxygen toxic lung. We give it to the uh, people who don't need it, and um, who certainly don't va need vasoconstriction, and basically we gave it to the heart attack patient. They, they, didn't, they didn't need it because we already knew the O2 sat was 96. The idea here is to make the heart job easier. We want to decrease the resistance from which it has to pump blood, and we want to present less blood to the heart. Uh, so we want to take care of both sides, the pre-side and the post-side. So the idea here is just to uh, titrate with IV nitroglycerin. That's generally the, been considered a way to do this. Nitro, it's titratable, goes on, on it's, it's adjustable. You can... Um, it can stop it and it'll, it'll go away quickly kind of thing. doesn't have any hours and hours and hours of a, effect. This is basically to unload the vascular tree. Reduction of preload. Preload. Preload is before the heart. So the idea here is basically we're going to give the same stuff like um, nitroglycerin to decrease the blood coming to the heart. We're going to give uh, nitroglycerin to decrease the pressure in, in the aorta so we can pump out more easily. One of the nuances of um, taking care of a, a acute episode of a heart failure is when do you give the Lasix kind of thing? This is assuming that we're talking about a patient who is fluid overloaded. Uh, not all uh, patients with heart failure are, but these most of them are. So when does the Lasix get put in, into the equation? The Lasix gets put into the equation after the nitroglycerin has been run. Why? Because Lasix has been shown to cause vasoconstriction when it's initially given. Yes, down the road it causes vasodilatation, but we don't want any vasoconstrictors in this process. And you just go look up any book, and it basically says that 
uh, LASIK, furosemide, will cause vasoconstriction. So the idea is to dilate first, then give the diuretic that you're going to um, try to unload these people's fluid. One of the things that you ought not do in these cases is automatically put a Foley catheter in for nursing convenience. Um, because that for catheter will be forgotten, it will be left in there, it'll go to the floor with the catheter in, and next thing you know, they've got a catheter-induced infection for nursing convenience. Flash pulmonary edema is a situation where you aren't overloaded and you don't want to give um, a a treatment that is going to drive water out. This is a patient who has a, a myocardial infarction, a, a bad one kind of thing, and all of a sudden, pumping power goes because of all the ischemia that's involved in the heart. And so there's quickly a backflow of bl- blood into the lungs. You get the, f- you get the butterfly, you get the, the, uh, the, the uh, leakage of fluid, the whole kind of thing. Heart size is small, though. Heart size is small. And uh, these people don't respond to uh, fluid. They, in fact, they, they need f- uh, fluid. And uh, they, they, what they also need is reduction of their peripheral vascular resistance so that the heart can easily pump out fluid into the vascular tree. Uh, Here's a couple of other drugs that people use um, to uh, take care of um, vasodilating uh, patients, and some of them have some nice benefits in addition, like uh, when you start giving the ACE inhibitors, you you know, there's there's a little renal protection. ACE inhibitors are given to virtually all diabetics to protect their kidneys. Uh, they do. Um, patients in congestive failure often are on these medications because they dilate, they protect the kidneys, they attenuate uh, the effect of the adrenaline, which you don't want out there in the first place, uh, except when you're in a really uh, in a bind. And it does uh, some other things with regards to uh, making, you, making, making it better for you. So let's see. Here's a, here's a list. Do you have any questions about the list? How about number three on the list? I acknowledge that the list is uh, a, a bit challenging. At least it's challenging here. On this list here is oxygen. Fine. It's not necessarily given to everybody. Morphine. You know, we have a... Morphine's a, a weak diuretic kind of thing. It's a sedative. But since when do we give sedatives to people who are drowning? The idea here is to undrown them and not sedate them kind of thing. So that's kind of old, to- old school. Uh, Ferrosamide, we'll give you that. Uh, nitro, that's okay. A uh, nitroprusside, mm, mm. uh, uh, niceratide, nah. uh, dalbutamine, as one of these things that say we're going to make your pump, heart pump even harder. No, they already have plenty of that. Milrinone, milrinone, basically, those drugs are associated with temporary improvement, but uh, temporary improvement, but increased sudden death. Um, Myocarditis is basically an itis. Is it an itis? Not a, well, it's not always an itis. I can tell you that. So here are some of the etiologies of this uh, pro- process. We don't know the cause. We just, had, uh, we just basically have a, have a heart that has basically become very weak. Maybe, it's, maybe it was a virus that caused it. Maybe, uh, maybe it's some other kind of infection. Maybe it's sh- uh, Chagas disease, with trypozoma. Cruzy, which is this parasite that gets into you. Maybe it's some drugs. Al- when you have alcohol to- uh, toxicity, alcohol will affect your brain. It'll affect your heart. The manifestation of alcohol screwing up your brain is pretty obvious. Manifestation of it screwing up your heart is less obvious. But alcohol, we don't call it alcoholic myocardi- uh, my- uh, myocarditis. We call it uh, alcoholic myocardiopathy myocardiopathy. We, we remove that itis from there because it isn't an itis. So we need to be more careful about this terminology. And carbon monoxide. We know that when somebody gets carbon monoxide poisoning, they can have residual neurologic problems forever because it affected their brain and, that, and the brain doesn't recover. Same thing applies with the heart as well. So myocarditis, basically a flu-like illness. This is what we're talking about here is viral myocarditis, a flu-like illness, myalgia, fever, uh, achiness, uh, inflammation in the myocardial tissue. One of the signs of this that you should be aware of is heart rate out of proportion to the patient's clinical setting. And that's a, that's, that is a trip tip-off. It doesn't happen all the time, but you should be aware of it. Why is this guy's heart going at 160? Um, and in children, every year their children die 
of myocarditis because it is, it is not recognized, not that there's necessarily anything you can particularly do about it, but they have look for disproportionate tachycardias in people who have viral, illness, viral illnesses. Sure, they can cause congestive heart failure. Sure, it can cause dysrhythmias. I had a 55-year-old emergency department friend. He was the director of emergency department somewhere in the, like around Wisconsin, somewhere up in there. He, had got, he was a perfect specimen. He did everything right to extend his life forever. And he developed viral myocarditis and was out jogging one day and dropped dead. Uh, at age 55, a thousand people went to his funeral. Um, EKG, you're going to have a few some uh, uh, findings here that we're going to look at. Well, we're, maybe there's going to be some tachycardia. Maybe the T waves are going to be down. Maybe there's going to be these saddle shaped ST segment kind of things, which we're going to see. Troponin is going to be elevated. Why? Because the, c the cells are sick and it's leaking out this stuff. It's got nothing to do with ischemia. Inflammatory markers, yeah, CD, C, uh, CRP and CED rate, yeah, they could be expected to go up, and an MR may show that you have some inflammatory processes there. Treatment is symptomatic. It means you can't treat it. So here's an EKG. The, look at Leeds V2. That saddle thing, that saddle is um, one of the characteristics of myocarditis. This one doesn't show, show any abnormal T waves. And, it, uh, you, and the rate looks like it's on the fast side, but it... Um, it doesn't look like it's overwhelmingly fast. Pericarditis causes, you can get an infection. Causes, you know, with this thing, uh, Dressler syndrome, after a myocardial infarction, two weeks later, you got this chest pain. It's, uh, it's a kind of a rubby chest pain. This is an inflammation of the pericardium uh, on the other side of where that heart, heart was infarcted. We have some connective tissue diseases that can cause this. Lupus can cause it. Neoplasms. There are two neoplasms that cause... Uh, pericarditis, uh, one of them, and they're both around the, the heart, lungs and breast. Lungs and breasts are, are higher high, um, in terms of this problem. Although there's uh, one cancer that loves to cause pericardial fusions, it's uh, malignant melanoma. You've heard of re uremic pericarditis, radiation. This is not from CT scans. This is medical radi radiation to kill stuff. And uh, basically, the, the idea here is you get this chest pain, and it's, it feels better when you sit up, and you can hear the rub when you sit up. And uh, one of the consequences is, are we going to get some um, pericardial tamponade? Physical exam, talking about the rub. There's going to be tachycardia. One of the things in pericarditis that you want to take a look at is not only is it a fast rate, but look at the PR interval. The PR interval is sagging down. That's one of the uh, key dif dif differentiators for uh, finding it from other tachycardias. So here's, this is clearly a fast ha heart rate. Um, and if you look at lead two, lead two is the best lead for looking at P waves. You'll see that there, the PR interval is below the baseline uh, interval for um, where it should be. It's, so the PR interval is depressed in this case. You do have some ST uh, changes or, uh, that are diffuse that do not follow any kind of uh, coronary artery pattern. Basically, the idea is to give anti-inflammatories. If you believe that's the cause, there are other causes, however, so it's not across the board. Um, cardiac tamponade basically is about the fluid that's accumulating now between the heart and the pericardium physically uh, compressing the heart so that it doesn't, doesn't take in fluid blood very well, doesn't pump out blood very well. So the blood pressure goes down. Uh, you can't hear very well because you've got all this padding of fluid be, uh, between the heart and the outside. The SC segment uh, 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 on the EKG becomes small because of all of this padding in, uh, uh, be between the outside of the chest and the heart and this fluid around it. In the, the you get this big bag-like um, heart uh, shadow. You can see here, though, that there's no increased interstitial markings as a result of uh, fluid, so this is not consistent with a uh, EK, uh, chest x-ray of um, pulmonary edema. And you get this thing, uh, other thing they call pulseless paradoxus. Pulseless paradoxus is, is not paradoxical. Pulseless paradoxus is an exaggeration of the normal... Uh, a phenomenon in that when you take a deep breath, 
You suck air into your chest, you suck blood into your chest. When you do that, the systolic blood pressure goes down. When you exhale, you, the air goes out and the blood goes out of the heart into the vascular tree, so the systolic pressure goes up. Take a deep breath, blood pressure goes down, exhale, blood pressure goes up. This is just an exaggerated response that occurs in these cases. It also occurs in um, chronic, uh, chronic lung disease exacerbation. So it's something to be aware of. That is, I think, that uh, then there's a couple of other things in pericardial tamponade. This is I, this idea of alternans, electrical alternans. This is kind of cool, actually. All, each beat's got a different looking QRS complex. Uh, low voltage, that's for sure. Here's, a, here's an ultrasound. The left ventricle and the left atrium look fine. You see beside the left ventricle and left atrium a little smash down thing here. That's the, the right, uh, right ventricle uh, because it's a lesser strong chamber than the um, left side of things. And then there was that little asterisk. That's the fluid in the, um, in the pericardial sac. So the diagnosis is easily made with um, ultrasound. So that is it. I think that there's nothing further, I don't think. That's it, okay.